next week as part of Amazon's inaugural Canadian Audible original series. Author and journalist Tanya Talega takes listeners on a journey of learning. It is both a departure from and a continuation of her previous work, which exposed racism and the terrible toll it's taken on Indigenous people in this country. The podcast is called Seven Truths, and it brings Tanya Talega back to our airwaves tonight from Toronto. Hi, it's really nice to meet you, even if it's just virtually. I mean, you know, I've been a fan of yours for a long time, and so it uh, feels like we know each other um, through social media, but yeah. I'm sad that we don't get the chance to actually physically meet, but I know that'll happen. Chi McDrick for saying that, because uh, I'm a huge fan of yours. Um, so most of us know you from your writing, from your books, your newspaper columns. What spoke to you about doing a podcast? Hmm. You know, there is something about returning to oral storytelling, and uh, I have found myself doing a lot of speaking in the last several years, and to be quite frank with you, it's something that I never really saw myself doing, but as I did more and more of it, I realized the power of oral story, you know, and that's a power that our people have had for such a long period of time. But for me, I have been more of a, of a writer, someone who quietly writes things, you know, in a corner. And that's why I went into newspapers as opposed to TV or standing on a stage. But there is something about our tradition of oral story um, that really, really was speaking to me. And podcasts seem like the perfect place to do that in you know um it's a way that we could use not just my voice but the voices of so many from our communities and tell our stories all together what are the seven grandfather teachings the seven teachings are love humility bravery wisdom honesty respect and truth now, on this journey, you are not alone. You're with someone that means a lot to you. You're with an elder. Who is he, and what does he mean to you? Miigwech for asking about Sam Ashnipaneskam. Sam means a lot to me. He has been someone who's been in my life since the inquest into the deaths of the Seven Fallen Feathers. I first met Sam there. And uh, he actually was sitting in front of me in the courtroom, and I remember... Um, you know, he's a tall man, and he sat right in front of me, and I couldn't see when he sat down. And um, I remember, you know, I, he had a long braid at the back of his, of his head, and I wanted to pull it and say, you know, <laughs> please move, I can't see anything. And um, uh, he seemed like a, a happy guy, a jovial guy, and I remember afterwards uh, going up to him and saying to him, um, just talking to him, just engaging him in the conversation. And then I noticed that he was the elder for the families of the seven students. And we started talking like we had always known each other. And that began the a friendship that we have. And I still speak to Sam. In fact, I was speaking to him this morning. I speak to Sam uh, every day. And he helps me on, on my own journey. And so it seemed like the perfect... He was the perfect person to bring forward on this podcast so Canadians could hear his voice explaining the seven grandfather teachings. Um, in the first episode, Love, you do discuss the seven fallen feathers, which you've been on this program talking about. Um, why was Love the appropriate theme for this awful tragedy? Mm. You know, it's important that we remember that we're motivated by love, love for our community, love for the people in our community, love for our ancestors, love for those that we have lost, love for our children. And all of the work that we do is not just for the here and now, it's for the generations and the generations that follow. It is for our children's children's children. And so when I was thinking about the teaching of love, I was thinking about Sam. I was thinking about the love that he has for our people, the love that he has for our community, and all of the things he's weathered in his life. You know, Sam is a survivor of three Indian residential schools, and he still gets up every day. He's positive. Sometimes he can get like, you know, uh, he can get a little angry and, you know, wonder why things are the way they are. But in his heart, he's got his teachings and his role is to pass those teachings on to others. 
to help inspire us to keep going, to keep fighting for our people. And that comes from love, a, a place of centered love that we all have. You mentioned that um, the podcast, you are telling stories from different people. You also share yourself a lot in this podcast, which I really appreciated because I can understand it's probably not as it's not a very easy thing to do. Um, I wanted to share a clip from one of the podcasts from the love episode. Um, let's take a listen. How can I walk a life every day of understanding of peace and love when our children are still dying in the waters of Thunder Bay? when our women are still being targeted and going missing, when our people are still incarcerated or shot and killed by police at high rates. How do I put aside the sorrow and anger of our society's failure to not judge a person by the color of their skin, but by the quality of their soul? The thing that um, stuck to me in my head is, how do you move um, every day and do this work? And that part where you said, how do I put aside the sorrow and the anger. How do you do that? Mm. That's a tough one, isn't it? You know, we all move in these circles um, to various degrees. But as an Indigenous person, you carry these things with you, you know. And um, love motivates me. It's hard. It's hard every single day, waking up, wondering, what are you going to hear this morning? You know, what are you going to hear has happened in Thunder Bay or that has happened in one of our communities from coast to coast to coast? We live with this every single day. We live with police violence. We live with the fact that our people are populating the jails at like just incredible levels. We live with the fact that our women are still going missing and are still so badly treated in this country. We live with two tiers of justice. We live with our people still fighting for their basic treaty rights, for basic human rights, for the right to having clean water. How does one every day go forward and say, today we're gonna, I'm gonna keep going and I am going to try and put on a brave face and a happy face? We do so through community. We do so through the people that we stand with. And I have to say that the people that I know and the people that are working for Indigenous rights across this country are wonderful. They are our youth. They are our elders. They are our leaders. They are our friends, our sisters, our brothers, our aunties, our uncles. And without them and that support, that continuum that we all feel, you know, I don't think I could do this work. And without them, I know I couldn't actually. You know, I came to this country as a refugee when I was um, maybe 10 years old. And I don't, I didn't really know very much about indigenous people. And I'm ashamed to say that I didn't learn it in school. I only started to learn about it more when social media, um, like on Twitter. And, you know, I feel great shame in that even when I look at certain um, words, I can't pronounce them. I should be able to because we are on uh, Turtle Island. One thing that I really appreciate about this podcast is that there's a lot of history in it. And you're able to learn the history by learning from people who were there when those events happened. In episode five, Honesty, you talk about Shoal Lake 39 First Nation in Northern Ontario. What did that episode reveal? Thanks for asking about that episode. You know, it's an incredible story, and it's a story that, you know, you couldn't make up if you tried. It's a story of Show Lake 39, a community um, outside of Kenora, Ontario, a community that for over 100 years, the city of Winnipeg has been taking the water from Show Lake 39 and the other community is Show Lake number 40. Um, it's also right there. And a giant aqueduct runs from Shoal Lake to the city of Winnipeg, and it delivers Winnipeg clean drinking water every single day. So every day that the people of Winnipeg get up and they turn their taps on, they have their coffee, they have their shower, they're doing so with water from Shoal Lake 39, Shoal Lake 40. Now, the thing is, is that Shoal Lake 39 has never been compensated for the use of that drinking water. And 
they are unable to use the area and the land that they have lived on for thousands and thousands of years due to the fact that the city is taking this water and shipping it all the way to Winnipeg. And believe it or not, there is still law on Ontario's books that allows for this. But also hidden in that law, it states that they will compensate any party who is injured by the removal of this water. Yet there is Show Lake number 39, and they have never been compensated for the removal of this water. It's, you know, a story that is rooted in the story of Canada itself. You know, the story of taking, the story to failing to recognize our rights as people, failing to recognize treaty rights. Treaties are laws of the land. They built this country. They're not just some piece of paper that is worthless or means nothing, but Canada's courts and governments have treated it as such. The people of Show Lake 39 should be compensated. And that is what this story is about. This is a story, this is an episode of honesty and how Canada needs to be honest with itself. Does Canada have what it takes to be honest? You know, we are capable of being honest, but do we choose to be honest? Does the government choose to be honest? You know, there has to be political will in across this country. That political will has to start from the people itself. You know, um, you can change all the laws you want in the world, but unless the will of the people is behind the changing of those laws, nothing will get done. And so we need to make sure we have the hearts and minds of Canadians who push lawmakers to do the right thing mm -hmm. and who themselves do the right thing. And until we do that, we will never have equity in this country. You know, and we're talking about Shoal Lake and the removal of water for the people of Winnipeg at the expense of an entire First Nations community. And it's incredible to me, too, that, you know, the city of Winnipeg has grown and thrived off the fresh water of Shoal Lake. Yet there is Shoal Lake number 39. They have not had the chance to grow and to thrive and to be the the power that they need to be, the economic power that they need to be as well, because of the loss of their water. Do you think, um, um, as I said, there's a, you know, I think there is, it is fair to say there is a gap in how history is taught in Canada. Um, I hope I'm not wrong, but from my own experiences. Do you think it's fair to say that if people did know more about the history, that they would be moved to uh, maybe act more? Oh, absolutely. You know, one of the things that I often speak about is the need for education reform. You know, we need to tell our children the truth about what's happened in this country. We need to teach what has happened in the Indian residential schools that existed from the mid 1800s to 1996 in this country. Like you mentioned, you didn't know um, about First Nations people when you came here and, you know, you go to school and then suddenly you, you're finding out through social media, you're finding out through books and through your own learning of what the truth is. We will only build a good and equitable Canada when we start telling our children the truth. And the truth is hard. You know, it's hard to admit that we have built a country without respecting treaties, without respecting nation to nation agreements. It's hard for Canadians to hear that there are two levels of citizens in this country. There are Indigenous people and there are non-Indigenous people. There are two sets of rights, you know. There's something called the Indian Act, which has governed the lives of every single status Indian in this country since 1876. And that is still law in Canada. Um, I think Canadians too. We do have. Um, we know very much. We know a lot about American history, and um, I thought it was interesting that through the podcast, you compared um, the Indian, the indigenous, the indigenous struggle in Canada to the Black Civil Rights Movement in America. Uh, in episode six, respect, you discuss uh, Kenora, Ontario. What happened there in 1974 um, that led to a civil rights uh, activism? Miigwech for asking about Anishinaabe Park. The Anishinaabe Park occupation happened in the summer of 74. And you know, it's something that should be written up in the history books across Canada. But of course, like many of our stories, it is not. But it is a history that people should know and that people should be proud of. 
proud of for the fact that this was coming on the tail of the civil rights movement that was happening in the United States in the 1960s. This is coming on the um, on the tail of the of Wounded Knee, of Alcatraz Island, of the birth of the American Indian movement, um, which actually happened in Minneapolis, Minnesota, by Ojibwe people, by Anishinaabe people. And members of AIM were actually there in 1974 at Anasnabe Park. Now, Anasnabe Park is uh, a park, and it's within Kenora. And this was a meeting place for so long, for centuries. First Nations people would come down through the rivers in Kenora, and this is a place that they would stay. This is where they would lay their head. It was a gathering place. It was a meeting place. And that piece of land was taken, and it was turned into... Um, a park and First Nations people were not consulted. This happened. And um, it was in the early 1970s when in the city of Kenora itself, a city that has struggled very much so with, with racism and a history of racism, um, the Ujibwe people in the area, they were holding a conference in the early 70s looking at things like the Indian Act looking at the things like how come we can't get health care? How come we can't get dental care? Why are the police being so brutal to our people? Um, I talked about this in the episode of the amount of arrests, the incredible amount of arrests of First Nations people for drunkenness, um, getting people, um, homeless people, and removing them from the land. Uh, this was in the early 70s and of the object police brutality that the people were experiencing. So a conference was held. A conference was held by the Ujibwe Warrior Society, which is a group of First Nations people who live in the area and said, you know what, this isn't okay anymore. And through that conference, it turned into an occupation of the park. And the occupation lasted, and it lasted. And we tell the story from one of the key figures who was there at the time, Lynn Skeed. And it's really quite amazing listening to her voice, you know, because she is a female warrior. She is someone that we need to hear. And I'm so grateful that she was able to talk to us. Her partner was Louis Cameron. And Louis Cameron was one of the Ujibwe Warrior Society founders who started the occupation in the park. And just an aside to that, they have a son. They have a son named Tyler. And uh, Tyler is also in the podcast, and he's reading the words of his father, remembering the days of the park, because Louis Cameron is lo no longer with us. And, you know, these voices of Louis Cameron and Lynn Skeed are voices that we need to hear. They are voices, and since the early 1970s, have been pushing for the exact same reforms and equities that we are still asking for today in 2020. Uh, you know, there's uh, another voice that we do hear on the final episode is somebody that's no longer with us. Um, in the final episode, Truth, you discuss the death of Barbara Kentner. Who was she? Barbara Kentner is, uh, was an Anishinaabe woman. She was a single mom. She was a loving sister. She had a family that loved her very much. And she was walking with her sister, Melissa, on a cold January night on the streets of Thunder Bay when a car passed them and outside of a, the car, a metal trailer hitch was hurled at her and her sister. It hit Barbara square in the stomach. Barbara Kentner died that summer after the hitch hit her stomach, uh, traumatizing injuries that occurred in her, in her belly. The story of Barbara Kentner is a story that speaks of truth. It speaks of the truth of what is happening to our women and girls in this country. It speaks to racism that Canada still has not, has not faced. It speaks to the racism of Thunder Bay. It speaks to why it is our people can't seem to walk down the street with have racist insults hurled at them, pieces of garbage hurled at them, or in this case, a metal trailer hitch hurled at her. And so we hear the story of Barbara Kentner told through her sister, Melissa, who was standing with her when that hitch went flying and hit her in the stomach, hit her sister in the stomach. And we also hear the story of Barbara Kentner through the journalist Willow Fiddler, who was at the time she was with APTN, but she's now with the Globe and Mail. And she covered that story. 
You know, she was there and she is a First Nations woman who lives in the city of Thunder Bay and experiences Thunder Bay every single day. And so to me, it was really important to have Willow's voice and to have Melissa's voice. And also you hear Barbara's voice through Willow's reporting in this episode called Truth. Um, the man accused of killing her, Braden Bushby, is currently on trial for manslaughter. We've been talking a little bit about justice, and it is a theme throughout this podcast. Do you think Indigenous people can get justice in Canada's criminal uh, justice system? No, I don't. I think that we really need to change the system that we have now. It is a system that was set up not to defend and protect Indigenous people, quite the contrary. You know, you can just see the fact that, and, you know, I talked about this earlier, about the, the prisons overflowing with First Nations and Métis and Wait people. Why is that, you know? Why is it that we have had a police force that um, in the last several months, many Indigenous people have died at the hands of the police? You know, um, when George Floyd died in the United States, I was mindful of what was happening in Canada, and many Indigenous people were mindful of the loss of life that our people have had at the hands of police here. You know, it starts from there. It starts from there. It looks into the court system. Why is it that it takes so many years for our land claims issues to finally come to pass, to finally be heard? Why is it that we are not properly represented in the justice system. You know, we are overrepresented in the prisons and underrepresented in the system itself. When you look at judges, when you look at lawyers, when you look at people that are stenographers, um, can we find justice in this country? We need a new way of doing things. And that's going to take, again, political will of everyone to realize what has happened in this country for the last 153 years has not been working, and we need a new way forward. Um, I just, we have about a minute and a half left. One of the episodes is titled Humility, and it kind of stuck with me because I think humility is on the individual to um, to figure out how they can be better, how what they what the, the role that they play. Um, Humility, uh, what role can humility play in these seven truths uh, with non-Indigenous people in Canada? Hmm. You know, I thought a lot about that, too, when I was uh, writing humility. I was thinking of, you know, this this particular story, um, and this is a story that uh, I hope, uh, an episode that I hope people listen to about, um, about two women, the relationship between two women, uh, an Indigenous woman and a non-Indigenous woman in Thunder Bay, and of the birth of the Nietzsche Art Studio, and what it means to be an ally, and what it means to be humble, and what it means to recognize your place in society and giving space and voice to someone else. And when I was thinking about this episode, I was thinking, you know, there are so many lessons here for everyone in Canada. There are lessons of humility that we need to hear. We need to make space for other voices. We need to make space for First Nations voices. And we need to examine what it means to be an ally. You know, someone may think they're being a good ally, but are they? You know, um, it's difficult. It's difficult to unteach what you've been taught as a child, what you have grown up in systems that you have grown up in, education systems, you know, justice systems, government systems, systems that are, there's systemic racism, you know, that's where the term comes from. It is embedded. And the systems are, it's like they're drinking their own water, their own Kool-Aid. We need to take that away and to start afresh and make new, new systems that are free of the past. Um, Tanya, it's been such a pleasure to speak to you. Congratulations on this podcast. I really, um, I, I felt the connection between you and Sam and seeing what's happening right now with our elders and COVID-19. Uh, it just brightened my heart. And hopefully one day in the after times, maybe I, we can meet up and I can buy Sam a Timmy's. <laughs> You know what? He would love that, I would like to say, and I would love that too. Yeah, but Miigwech I think... for offering us this opportunity. Miigwech for this time, and uh, I know this is going to help people understand the history more, and the relationship between you is just great. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Miigwech, be well. You too.
The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.